Hello, I'm going to read through Proverbs chapter 25. So there's only six more chapters to go, and who knows, I might go through a few more tonight, maybe all of them. Maybe this will be the only one, I don't know. But this one says more Proverbs of Solomon. Verse 1 says, There are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. So that's just an interesting side note, I guess, just a historical reference that the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out these proverbs that Solomon wrote and kept kept them so that we have this. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2 says, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that this was the first chapter that had any kind of intro verse like that. But uh, these are still Proverbs that are written by Solomon. I know the last one or two Proverbs, I think, are written by someone else. But So verse 3 says, the heaven for height, or I'm sorry, verse 2, what am I doing? Verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. So, I'm not really sure what that means, but it makes me think how, you know, God's wisdom is, uh, you know, out of our comprehension. And uh, there's so many mysteries involved with creation and God. And uh, that shows how, you know, he is above us. And so that makes me think of, that's, that makes me think maybe that's what that's talking about. How he is, uh, I don't know if unsearchable is the right thing, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. And so, you know, men seek wisdom, and God has wisdom, and God is above us in every way, basically. So that makes me think that's kind of what that means. And maybe that's what it's talking about, wisdom, maybe, the kings to search out a matter to search for the godly wisdom. Um, <clears throat> but verse 3 says, The heaven for height, the earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. The heaven for height, the earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. And again, I am... kind of like very high, very low, is it's, you know, we know that God knows everything, everything that's in creation, even the heart of man. Verse 4 says, take away the dross from silver and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Talking about refining the silver. Verse 5 says, Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. So, talking about a kingdom or a nation Take away the wicked. Verse 6 says, Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king. And verse 7 continues on, says, For better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. So... 
it's better to be called to the king. Um, instead of kind of arrogantly putting yourself before the king. Lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof. When thy neighbor hath put thee to shame, go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what thou do in the end thereof. When thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. You know, it just makes me think again of the verse before where it talks about um, put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, but then, you know, in Hebrews we know as far as concerning the Lord Jesus, you know, he asks us to come boldly to the throne, which is, you know, a great blessing from God that... Um, you know, he wants us to come to him, and he wants to hear our pleas. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself, and discover not a secret to another. So it's saying, <clears throat> go not forth hastily to strive with your neighbor. So it makes me talk about like having a contention with another person. Don't just go after another person, you know, seeking to fight or seeking revenge because you might not know how that might turn out. It might turn out even worse for you. But it says, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. And it says, and discover not a secret to another. And then verse 10, it says, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame. So when it says discover not a secret, when we think of discover, we think of finding something. Like I discovered this, so... But it seems like in this context, it's like telling that, you know, or don't let another discover your secret. Maybe it's just kind of like the wording's kind of like backwards. Discover not a secret to another. It's like don't give a secret to another to discover, so so the other person discovers the secret. They like keep your secrets, I guess, if... Um, if there's a reason for that, lest he heareth it, put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away, and thine infamy. So what does it mean, and thine infamy turn not away? It makes me think, I don't know, maybe if you're striving with the neighbor... You know, maybe this makes me think of, maybe, because it's talking about having a contention, like, with one person, and it's maybe, and then it says, like, talk to that person yourself. Maybe it's saying not to tell another person that you're having a problem with this person, because that person might hear it, you know, from this person or whatever, that you're going around saying this. And then... uh and then, you know, he's going to be more upset at you, you're going to be more upset at that person, and it's like it just gets worse. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. That's a really interesting verse. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Apples of gold and pictures of silver sounds like something very good. <laughs> um, verse 12 says, as an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. 
going back to the importance of words. And I guess how, you know, the right words, you know, the right, right, right words spoken or spoken in the right way can ease a situation. A wise reprover upon an obedient ear. The wise reprover would be basically just the person with the, with the wise words. A wise reprover would, would use words wisely. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him. And for he refresheneth the soul of his masters. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger. So it's saying kind of like the cold of snow is in the time of harvest is kind of a good thing. It's interesting to see all these literary, all these comparisons. Um, I guess like is, you know, it's been so long since I've thought about these figures of speech, and that was a big thing that I was always studying. But there's, I know there's a metonymy, and, um, but I don't know which one where it always says this is like this. I need to get back into reading this. <laughs> it's pretty bad that I can't even remember that. You know, there's the parables, and I'm trying to think of the words for that. But anyways, they're comparisons, I guess. There's a lot of them here. It's like apples in pictures of silver. It's like an earring of gold, an ornament of fine gold. It's like the cold of snow in the time of harvest. Anyway, verse 14 says, Whoso both boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Again, it's like comparing these. There's synecdoche, there's... Hmm. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Whoever boasts himself of a false gift is a liar. And basically, you know, pointless. I guess clouds without wind or without rain just block the sun. I don't know. Um, I know they think of rain and stuff as blessing a lot. And um, maybe that because of the farming and stuff. And so it's, you know, it's like a cloud without the blessing. It's just, I don't know. 15 says, By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. So that seems pretty extreme. A soft tongue breaks the bone. <laughs> so again, just the power of how you use the words. Hast thou find, found honey? Question mark. Hast thou find honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. I remember in the last chapter, not too long ago, he was talking about honey. I can just go back to it if I could find it, but it was something about the honeycomb. Mm. Yeah. Right here, Proverbs 24, 13, My son, thou eat thou honey, because it is good, and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. And he said, So, so shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto to thy soul. And the only reason I mention that is because I'm wondering, okay, is that kind of the same idea here? where the honey represents something else. Um, you know, you have to think that he's not just think like, talking about honey. Literally. And 
hast thou find, found honey? If he was talking about knowledge, you know, it always seems like he's always talking about more and more, like, obtaining more and more knowledge is a good thing, always. But here, if, if, if he was talking about comparing, like, the honey with knowledge again, he's saying, you know, only only take what is sufficient, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. So it makes me think, if he was talking about knowledge, it could be like somebody who ends up thinking that they, they're a know-it-all or something, you know, kind of what you do with that knowledge, or if you become arrogant because you think you have so much wisdom. Um, or maybe it's something else, completely different idea, I don't know. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee, and so hate thee. And what does that mean? Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee. A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor's neighbor is a maul, and a sword, and a sharp arrow. A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul. Is that like what splits wood, like the maul? And a sword and a sharp arrow. So, I guess how it separates, because just like we talk about they talk about in the Bible how the Word of God is like a sword and it separates. And so, false witnesses separate people. They put each other in a contention against each other. And I don't know what it means about withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee and so hate thee makes me think about, like, keep your nose out of your neighbor's business, like, 24-7, <laughs> you know. Uh, let your neighbor be your neighbor, uh, you know. And neighbor doesn't just mean your next-door neighbor, just like brother doesn't mean genetic brother. I always think that neighbor and brother and words like that are a lot of times just referred to as, you know, mankind, your humanly neighbor, just another person. And so I don't think I don't think the house is really like literally it's not literally a foot it's not literally a house I think the idea is give your you know give people space don't be having your nose up people's behinds uh, or they're gonna get sick of you and start to resent you that's kind of what I get out of that verse 19 says confidence is an unfaithful man in the time in time of trouble is like a broken tooth, a foot out of joint. Those are no good. A broken tooth, a foot out of joint, useless. They don't serve their purpose, right? Confidence in an unfaithful man in a time of trouble. So yeah, what good is confidence in an unfaithful man? So I'm trying to think of kind of the context of, you know, the unfaithful. I mean, you can be confident because you can have faith. You know, faith and confidence can kind of go hand in hand. You know, I think you think of faithful also as like trust. You know, you think about relationships between men and women, husband and wife. You know, if one of them's unfaithful, one of them cheated or whatever. So they're not trustworthy. So, you know, confidence in a person that you can't trust in a time of trouble. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I don't know, it, it seems like... Also, unfaithful... In a time of trouble, they don't have faith. How can they have confidence? 
Anyway, let's go next to as he that taketh away a garment in cold weather and as vinegar upon nitrate. Nitri. I don't know what that means. As vinegar upon nitri. Or nitire or whatever. Niter. I don't know how that's pronounced. But there are so many of these comparisons. I think there's more of these in this chapter of Proverbs than there has been in any other one. As he that taketh away a garment in cold weather. Okay, so you want clothes pulled, you don't want less, right? And vinegar upon nitre, that's probably not a good thing, whatever that means. It seems like he's going with kind of the negatives. So is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. Okay, maybe not. I don't know, singeth songs to, to a heavy heart sounds actually good but how is taking away a garment in cold weather good hmm maybe someone singing songs to a heavy heart isn't good I don't know I'm not really I'm kind of confused about this verse and I don't even know you know what vinegar upon nitre means so that's definitely a verse I just gotta look into if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. That's pretty simple. For thou shalt reap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Now that's, isn't that exactly what's said in Romans 12, too? For thou shalt heap, and you know, I've heard, I remember we always talked about this in church, uh, Bible study groups, and they talked about how back in the days, you know, keeping the coals for their fires or whatever, like that was something that they always needed. And to keep, to put fire, coals, basically to give them coals was, um, kind of like lowering lowering them because you were helping them or you were doing it for them. It's kind of like wiping their butt or something. Okay, like um, makes them ashamed because they can't, they couldn't handle things on their own, basically. Um, thou shall heap coals of so it's not like, uh, I think a lot of people when they read this, it almost sounds like you're setting their head on fire or something like, yeah, you should give them a drink if they're thirsty or food to eat if they're hungry because it's kind of like, it's kind of like burning them to death or something. It's like, well, it's like that's not what it means, I guess, in the historical context. The Lord shall reward thee. But, you know, we're, we're supposed to love our enemies help people that are in need, and it's always not the easiest thing to do. But, verse 23, The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. So, that's an interesting verse, too. Is that saying it's a good thing to have an angry countenance if... Is it just is it just stating like a fact that uh, or is it just saying you know instead of acting instead of instead of taking a swing on a person just give them a give them a bad look or. Is it just the fact that, you know, an angry look can shut people up? I don't know. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. I think we can all understand what he's talking about there. Um, 
Yeah. So, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. So, the brawling woman, you know, I think it's talking about like a husband and a wife. You don't want your wife to be unhappy. And, you know, it's not always up to the husband, but it's supposed to the husband's best ability to do his best to satisfy his wife in whatever way. I think that's kind of the idea of it. Um, but, again, it just makes me think, if, since Solomon had so many wives and everything, that this has to be from his own personal experiences that he was writing. So cold waters to a thirsty soul, or as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Good news is a good thing. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Yeah, that's not a good thing. A righteous man falling down before the wicked. I don't think that's saying that like the righteous man is slain or something, or that the wicked men overcame the righteous man it could be but makes me think of uh just somebody who's like a traitor you know somebody who at least appeared righteous for a time uh you know just all of a sudden siding with somebody who's not that's what it makes me think of but it's something i'd have to look into it is not good to eat much honey. Here we go about honey again. So for men to search their own glory is not good. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. You gotta have rule over your spirit. And if you're a husband, you gotta have a rule over your wife. <laughs> Or you'll be on the rooftop. No, I don't. No, this is a pretty good chapter. Again, I think there's a lot here. Um, very poetic and a lot of literary devices, figurative, figures of speech used here. So, yeah, that's a good one. Verse chapter 25. Okay, guys, I'm going to end this here. God bless.